Hi, everyone. Dr. Elizabeth Bonet here. Dr. Liz, welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. Before we jump in, please note that the podcast is not mental health treatment, nor should it replace mental health treatment. If you need psychotherapy or hypnotherapy, please seek treatment from a trained professional. I do hypnosis all over the world, so please feel free to contact me through my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. Hi everyone, Dr. Liz here. Just a reminder, if you're listening to this in September of 2021, that the Hypnotize Me podcast survey is going on. There's a link in the show notes that's easily accessible. It only takes you a couple of minutes and it really helps me out to know who are my listeners and what do they want to hear. So I would totally appreciate it if you took it. Now let's talk about Dr. Eric Zelinsky. He is a really fun interview and talks about his really traumatic past and what happened to him before he felt like he transformed his life, not just with essential oils, those came a little bit later, but through a religious transformation and then becoming a doctor of chiropractic and along the way, meeting his wife, Sabrina, also called Mama Z, who sounds incredible. She's not on the interview, but I would love to have her on the podcast. Dr. Z just put out a new book, The Essential Oils Apothecary, and he has published books before. And he also has a fantastic free ebook that you'll hear me talk about on his website. That's really just the beginning, though. I really would encourage anyone to purchase his more in-depth books you know, he just has a heart of gold. We had done this interview before, and it actually there was just something off about it that didn't vibrate with either one of us. And after I ended the interview, he actually called me and said, hey, Elizabeth, something about that didn't feel right. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad you called because I felt the same way. So he's like, why don't we redo it and really focus on what we want to focus on? On the first interview, we got off onto these tangents that... I don't think would have been really helpful for people. So I said, great, Eric, let's do that. So I just think he has a heart of gold and he's very genuine and down to earth. And both he and his wife are really here to help people, which, you know, is my jam too. So I hope that comes across during this interview and that you learn a lot and that you enjoy it. Have a wonderful week. Peace. Hi, Dr. Z. Welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. Well, hello. I'm so excited to be chatting with you. This topic is, I don't know what else to say other than, you know, from the depths of sorrow, birth solutions and birth health and healing. And so when it comes to anxiety and panic, it was something that really debilitated me. And and coming from the throes of that to where I'm at right now, it's like, wow, I hope I could help just one person not live through what I lived through. And this would be so worth it. Wow. I had no idea. When did you, was this a childhood thing or when did you first start experiencing anxiety? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I was raised, you know, I was raised in a very volatile home. And and I say that to say my mom and dad did the best they could, but we had some really, really tough times. And my mom really struggled with the abuse that she had when she was a girl. Mm -hmm. And so that some of that was passed down to us. And as she was working out exactly what to do and what, what life should be like, you know, it was really, hard. I mean, it was really hard. Every, everything from being on government assistance and food stamps when we were really, really young to developing just social phobias when I was in grade school up mm-hmm. until when I was in college, I was so introverted, so afraid to not, it, this was way beyond like speaking in front of people. Like this was yeah. like a deep rooted um, self-consciousness, like a self-hatred, a deep rooted, when I say social phobia, just just not even being comfortable in my skin, really having a hard time developing friendships. Mm-hmm. And and those friendships I did have were very toxic to me. I mean, those those people that, quite frankly, weren't really friends. And so, you know, you fast forward 
when I was a teenager, I had a lot of health issues, a lot because of the fear and the social anxiety I dealt with as a kid. And I had a lot of gut challenges, gas, mm -hmm. bloating, gut issues. I developed cystic acne. And, and at the time, like what did kids do in the you know, early nineties was you get on Accutane, which is now known as the suicide drug, right? So I took Accutane. Yeah, I did too. I was on Accutane. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, it was called the suicide drug for a reason, right? First I was on antibiotics for about 10 years. Then yeah. I was on Accutane. You too. <laughs> so, yeah. And so chronic, and I wasn't on antibiotics specifically for acne, but I was on antibiotics a lot for chronic ear infections, throat mm -hmm. infections, that stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, chronic antibiotic misuse, Accutane, social phobias. Next thing you know, I started to develop panic attacks and significant anxiety where I knew nothing else other than the self-medicate. So I fell into narcotics. I fell into alcohol. Like I was an alcoholic by the time I was a late teenager, early adult, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And I'll never forget working wow. at a bar and a pharmacist, this guy, this cool looking pharmacist who was, you know, here he was at a bar drinking. So it wasn't like, he mm -hmm. wasn't like a teetotaler, but I'll never forget me smoking and talking to this pharmacist at the time, because I was again at, at a bar situation where bartenders or, or waiters would smoke while they work right back in the day. And he said, you know, that's not helping you with your anxiety. Because I was telling him about anxiety and panic. And I'm like, what? It makes me calm down. He's like, no, the nicotine in your system is actually causing you to be more anxious. And it's a stimulant. Yeah, right. And I didn't think about that. So I had this, this pharmacist tell me, hey, you're actually aren't doing what you should do. Well, that was my life. That was my life until I had my, my revelation when I became a Christian when I was 23 years old is, is when I hit my proverbial rock bottom mm -hmm. is when I really started to contemplate how to kill myself. Wow. And it was one of those things where I never actually attempted it, but it was called, and it is called suicide ideation, where you start to imagine, you start to wonder, you start to think, you start to plan, you start to... Mm -hmm put things into perspective were what if, what that. Yes. And that was my proverbial rock bottom at the time that I was at. And again, self-medicating with, with street drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so all of it really stemming from social phobias, fears, anxiety, and panic. Mm -hmm. This is so interesting. It's like a, a complete 180 from who you are today. Yeah. And it is. And, and you know, the thing is this, is that for me, I mean, and I know I could sh share, share this on your, on your show where other shows might be a little more restrictive, but I say this with all due respect in that it was when I found Christ and mm -hmm. it was when I became, when I had a spiritual epiphany, mm -hmm. it was when I got connected to the divine. It was that at that moment when I finally had purpose, because a lot of what I dealt with was the self negative down talk. Like I'll never forget. Yeah. I'll never forget being a kid. I'm talking my kid's age, nine, 10, 11, saying to myself, I'm not smart enough to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. Like I started downplaying myself. Like I don't have a good memory. I can't do this. And even though I was getting good grades at school, I convinced myself out of chasing my dreams. It wasn't until I was 29 years old that I actually had the confidence I could actually go to school and chase after the dream of becoming a doctor, which I ended up becoming a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. But I took the easy way in college. When I went to college, I took the easy route. I'm a natural writer. So I took an English route and that was easy for me. I got straight, you know, straight A's and B's through college uh -huh. because I never challenged myself. Yeah. But okay. But this explains part of like why your writing is so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, my dad's really? a writer. Yeah. I, I'll never. <laughs> oh, yeah, your dad's a writer yeah, too. Yeah, okay. My dad's a writer. I'm a writer. But yeah, that's why I took English because it was something I knew I could do and I didn't have to apply myself. And guess what? No failure. Yeah. I'll never forget the down talk of like, you can't do this. You can't do that. Yeah. And that's very, very related to anxiety. And yes. I find particularly social anxiety. And this is where maybe some people listening are like, okay, where's this guy going? Mm -hmm. What caused, what this caused was not only social phobia, anxiety, panic, fear, right? Fear, especially being in, in a, you know, semi type of abusive household, the fear, the fear, the fear yeah. was that not having a purpose, not knowing what my place in life was, because I kept on talking down to myself. I kept on saying, I can't mm -hmm. do this. I can't do that. I found myself in such a deep place of despair with no purpose, with no 
point of where I fit in the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that to me was what really drove me to suicide ideation. Because Mm -hmm. if there is no end to this, if there's no reason to what you're doing, if you have no value, I guess that's really what it boils down to. If you're listening right now, or if you have a friend or a loved one, we know right now in, in, in other countries, in other places that, especially in America, that suicide not only ideation, but the actual attempt and accomplishing suicide is just skyrocketing right now in 2021, yes. right? And yeah, 2020 a, and 2021 because of COVID. Yeah. And a reason behind that though, a big reason behind that is, is people losing their jobs Yes, and having this sense of purposelessness, mm-hmm. not having value. We get so much value from our work. And we from do. me, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who works in working with people on disability and getting them off of disability. And he and I have had extensive conversations about how work affects someone's self-esteem, yes. sense of purpose, their ability to even function like a, a structure to, to help them function day to day. It is so, so helpful. Even with the flip side of a lot of us fantasize about, oh, you know, never wanting to work again, right? Like never having to, not wanting to, but never having to work again. There's always that fantasy running in a lot of people. But um, that's an empty COVID, fantasy, though. It is. It is, is. It's like I learned very quickly oh, yeah. during COVID. Like I love to work. I need to work. We it need it. We need purpose. Better. Yeah. We need value. Absolutely. You need, you know, and this goes, it sounds like we're going to have a fun conversation of tangents. Here's a tangent for everybody. Uh-huh. If you haven't, watch this documentary look up the documentary happy just h-a-p-p-y the documentary Mm -hmm. happy is about positive psychology and research has proven once your finance once your physical needs are met and that's relative depending on where you live in the world food shelter clothing basic (laughs) needs in america that's roughly 55 or sixty thousand dollars a year combined income once you reach that it doesn't matter if you make 500,000, 5 million or $500 million. There is no relation to making money and happiness. But what happiness Correct. is connected to is loving what you do. And here's what they this documentary showed. I don't want to take the thunder away from it. You're going to love it. You're going to cry. You're going to laugh. You're going to be inspired. Mm-hmm. But this documentary showed this rickshaw driver in India as an example of someone who is happy because he loves what he does, but he's living in a shack, but his needs are met. But he has yes. value. He has value. Yeah, I, I have actually watched the documentary when it came right? out. And, right? Yeah, because I I followed the happiness research for a long time. And the African-American guy flipping burgers in the Bronx or whatever it was, right? He was flipping burgers yes. at some greasy spoon. He's like, I love what I do. I make my food. I love my food. I love my customers. So yes. it doesn't matter. So the thing is, is you we need our goal, and this is what I feel is the lie from the pit of hell, is to take that value out of our work and to put us in this sterile environment where we just feel like... Like we're a cog in this wheel that never ends. But that's really where the 2020, 2021 rise in anxiety and panic because so many people were stripped of their jobs and their work and their value. Yes. And for me, as a young kid, I started to really because it, it maybe, you know, if you're not familiar with my work, if you're if you've never been to my website or read my books, you could maybe hear in my voice, this is who I am. And as passionate I as as I am about what I'm doing now, I was passionate in the other way. Like I give my 120% percent and everything that I do. So mm-hmm. I just didn't dabble into drugs. I became an addict. Mm-hmm. So I just don't dabble into health. I like change everything in my life. I just don't use a drop of essential oils. It, I convert everything. It's just my nature. So when my nature is to is just this overwhelming sense of energy into whatever that I do. And so when I said like, why am I here? I have no Mm -hmm. purpose. I'm too stupid to do this, or I can't do that. I don't have enough money. My parents are broke. Like my, at the time, my dad was a truck driver. I I don't have the silver spoon. I don't have the white privilege. Everyone else I see around me has, right? I'm like Mm -hmm. struggling. I'm struggling. Where's my purpose? Where's my value? And I found myself in a dark, dark hole. And then Mm -hmm. I had my spiritual revelation. I found purpose and love and meaning in my relationship with Christ. And I kid you not, I kid you not. I'm telling you what my experience is. I can't prove Mm -hmm. it. I can't validate it. But next thing you know, I had this like, I'm lost. Now I'm found. I'm blind. Now I see moment. And it was like when I had my moment, it was March 16th, 2003. When I had my, my spiritual conversion, all that left me, Mm -hmm. the anxiety, the pain, the emotional pain, the addiction, 
all that left me. I had wow. a chronic stammering condition. People that deal with anxiety and panic, I will never forget being ever since I was in first grade, all the way through middle school, I would go to a speech therapist and that even caused more social anxiety because here it was in the middle of the day and knock, 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 Dr. Cooper enters the door like, hey, Eric, you ready for your session? And why is Eric leaving the classroom and everyone's teasing me, right? Because I couldn't talk very well. I was a stutterer. Well, look what I'm doing now. I'm like a professional speaker. Who would have thought yeah. my my greatest gift would have been a compromise to be my weakness? And now here I is where I'm at today. And so I saw the transformation. So, so you never went through recovery after this this transformation? Not for the addiction. Believe it or not, I tried no. to quit. I tried to uh-huh. quit drugs. I tried to quit drinking. I tried to quit smoking multiple times on my own. I always relapsed. I've never relapsed. It's been 18 years. But here's wow. the key though. Here's a part of my story that I value. It's like Paul talks about in the Bible that thorn in his flesh. What happened was I developed like significant gut disorders, like leaky gut. I had, again, mm-hmm. the acne. I had chronic pain. I'll never forget going to a neurologist. He took an MRI. I was like, I think 22 at the time. And he says, what did you do to your back? You have a spine of a 50-year-old. Mm. And I don't know all that would happen, but I'll tell you, you know, bitterness, regret, rottenness in the bones. It it like, it, it, it plagued me. It caused me to age prematurely. So I, those things didn't go away. Mm -hmm. The anxiety, the depression, the emotional, the mental distress vanished within a minute, the addiction gone. And now it's like, okay, I got this other stuff now. And I prayed I prayed, I prayed. I said, God, if you could take this stuff, why wouldn't you take this away? And I feel it was a gift to me because it started now, it's become now an 18 year journey of learning how to heal myself and heal things naturally. And that's where I've met essential oils. That's why I exercise and do the things I do with food is because Mm -hmm. I needed to heal myself. And that really is what birthed everything that we've done with our Bible health ministry and why I wrote this recent book, The Essential Oils Apothecary, because mm-hmm. people need tools to manage not only symptoms, but the root cause of disease. And so Absolutely. at the core, I hope and I wish everyone has their like, I was blind, now I see moment and God takes a burden off your shoulders. But if some areas like me, if some areas are lacking in that you need help or you need support in that time mm-hmm. where you're believing for your healing, well, I don't see anything on the planet like essential oils that can help with symptom-based management that has zero complications and zero side effects if you use them the right way. Yeah. Well, hypnosis. That too. <laughs> right? That too. Right. Of course. Of course. So we'll do it. We'll tie for number one. How about this? We'll compete. We will. I'll give you the tie. <laughs> But, you know, hypnosis is not appropriate for everything. And I, I think um, that is why I interview people about all kinds of healing methods and healing ways. And I was really impressed with the free ebook that I got off your website and um, all the different information in it on essential oils and the recipes in it. You have in it gut health vaginal health, like all kinds of different ways to work with essential oils. So how did you first discover them? Yeah. So, you know, in my healing journey, again, I was 23 years old when I had my epiphany and I started looking at things one by one by one. And all of it started with my gut because that was the main concern. Um, I struggled. I really struggled with my eating and figuring out what to do. So one by one by one through a process of figuring out elimination diet, going to different experts and local people, I really wrapped up what were the triggers and why I had chronic gut dysfunction, why I had acne and why I had pain throughout my body and brain fog and all that other little, all that other aching things that just nag at you. Mm -hmm. And so that was great. I mean, Literally two years later, I was like better than I've ever been, Mm -hmm. but I never had a medicine cabinet, meaning what would I do if this happened? And so at this point, again, as extreme as I was doing street drugs, alcoholic, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day to now being extreme, like natural health, I wouldn't take a a pill or a drug if my life depended on it. Again, that was, that's who I am, right? So here I am developing whatever it might be. Um, a histamine reaction, allergic reaction, an athlete's foot, something, a jock itch, something like what's your medicine cabinet full of, maybe an upset stomach. I would literally Mm -hmm. just grin and bear it and not do anything and just suffer through that season or that symptom. 
And I, I started like perfectly considering I need something. I need like medicine, but I'm not willing to go to the pharmacy. So again, this is, this is my pride. Maybe this is where I'm at. Well, I meet my wife who now became my wife and she just loved essential oils. That was part of her healing story. By the way, you'd love to have her on um, hypnobirthing mm-hmm. was the key thing for her, for her, for home births. And, and so when I met her, Beautiful. yeah, she yeah. loves it. So when I met her, she had a, she told me about a chemical burn that she had when she was 14 years old with some product that she was using in the well water from her grandparents water source that she was in Minnesota literally burned the first two to three layers off of her skin from the um, top of her lip to essentially where her Adam's apple would be if she were a guy, Aww. but in the middle of the neck, Ouch. literally burned, like just, Aww. she looked like a, a burn patient and nothing worked. No cream, no medicine, nothing worked until her mom's friend who is Cherokee Indian practicing Ojibwa medicine said, Hey, you, you need to try essential oils. She gave my mm-hmm. wife her first kit and my wife started experimenting with lavender and some aloe and some coconut oil. And next thing you know, it got better. And that started her on now what has been a 28 year journey using essential oils for everything. So all that to say is that I'd really look to my wife over the course Mm -hmm. of some years to be like, okay, what do we do for this? What do we do for that? But I'd never had my own little conversion to essential oils until my daughter at the time was 11 months. And she developed a 104 temperature. And that's a that's a pretty high temperature. Yeah. Most parents would rush their kids to the urgent care for that. Mm-hmm. And my wife's like, no, we got this. And I'm like, no, you no, we're gonna take her to the hospital. Like I was that dad, she was that mom. I was arguing with her. I'm like, as natural mm-hmm. as I was, I don't want my kid to, you know, to, to die. I mean, there's a, a limit to my extreme, you know, extreme nature. And what she did was she created this little mixture of some some oil, like I think it was olive and coconut oil, a couple drops of peppermint, a couple drops of orange. And she just gave my daughter, my, my baby girl, right, a neck and a back and a foot rub. And she just let her just be for a few minutes. And about 20 minutes later, we checked the temperature. It just dropped to 102. And then another hour or two later, it dropped to 101. And then the next day, I actually, we checked it again. It finalized at like 99. The next day we checked, her baseline became 101. Like we woke up in the morning, like, wow, 101, that's great. She did the application mm-hmm. again. The, within an hour or two, the temperature went down to like 98.6. The next day, Whoa. it's just within two, three days, she was gone. Wow. I'm like, what is this stuff? Like, that's when I hit my own moment. As a person, as a dad, as a husband, as just your neighbor, you know, that was like, this stuff is legit medicine. And yeah. at the time, I was a medical writer and one of my clients, just about, a, I think a year or so later, one of my clients commissioned me, so did, you know, coincidentally, if there is such a thing, um, <laughs> to write a series of public health reports on, guess what, essential oils. So now mm-hmm. it was literally my job, my J-O-B. Yeah. To research hundreds of trials to show how can essential oils help with blood pressure, blood sugar balancing, maybe weight loss. Does it have any mm-hmm. sort of anti-cancer effects? And so that's what I dove into for months. And fast forward, what now, eight years, here we are today. It's been a wonderful journey where, you Very know, cool. yeah, it's been a yeah. wonderful journey of, of A, I think the one thing I want to share, I guess my summary is to appreciate something. At, mm-hmm. at like a heart level, at like a relationship level, like a real like one-on-one level, but then also having something make sense at a cognitive level. Because it like yes. for me, faith only goes so far. Like I have to understand my faith. You know, as mm-hmm. a Christian, I'm just like, okay, whatever, George, just tell me what to do. No, it has to make sense. So when I became a Christian, I studied archaeology. I studied history. I said, okay, like, did this really happen? Did that really happen? Was there really an ark? Was there in Jonah? <laughs> so I had to understand things mentally. And so when the mental component matched up with my faith that I saw essential oils work, it, it literally shaped my life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. That's an amazing story. Wow. So when did you start using it for anxiety? Or you didn't? Oh, I'm sorry. I messed the story. (laughs) Like you felt like your anxiety was lifted. Well, no, 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 no. Good point. Had the religious conversion. Yes. Oh, good point though. 
you are never, ever truly free. Meaning this, you always have to be careful. You always have to watch out and things can trigger what may have been a thing of the past. That's why we see so many cancer patients relapse. Why? Because they don't stop smoking. Why? Because they're still eating fast food. Why? Because they're not changing their life. The cancer just comes mm -hmm. back, right? That's a big cause of it, by the way. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've always had, ever since I've been a baby, like this was in the womb. And I know you'd understand this more than most. This was in the womb. Like my mom had significant anxiety, even about me even being born. Like there was, mm -hmm. there was birth trauma. You know, I, I was never breastfed. I was formula fed. Like there was this separation. Like there was this anxiety ever since I've been an infant in, in the mm -hmm. womb. So this is, this is part of me that will always come up. Like mm -hmm. I will... If I get nervous and if I get anxious, I will stutter. Even today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like a physical marker of what's happening in my soul. Yeah, I think people have defaults. Yes. Um, for some people, it's depression. For some, it's anxiety. Yes. For some, like you're saying, a stutter will come out. Um, people have these individual, and it is very individual defaults that happen of like, oh, but in therapy, I call them like, let's figure out your early warning signs. Yes, let's exactly. figure out the early flags so that you can learn how to take care of that. That's a process I learned in my own therapy. Depression tends to be my default where it's like, okay, if I know that that's coming up, then let me make sure I, I take good care of myself in you know various ways. And again, that's individual too. So you're saying anxiety is yours. Oh yeah. And that's, and so okay. at the time, like my healing of my putting it into remission started, you know, that was 18 years ago. That was, that was the benefit of my spiritual conversion. That's the only way of explaining it. But, but there's a, but is that it is not an everyday battle, not at all, but yeah. it's saying that here's something I've learned. It could come up at any moment of any day. It's one mm -hmm. of those things where if if I'm not living the life I need to live, if I fall into any sort of bad habits, it's that anchor that brings me mm -hmm. right back to the social fears, anxiety, the panic, all yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And, so and that, I know yeah. for a lot of people too that that's stress, like stress will tip yes. it off. You know, something yep. super stressful. Um, but yeah, it's also this sense of... Um, are you doing what you need to do to take care of yourself on a daily basis? And when that starts to slack, when people start to slack on that, it's like, oh, you know, all right, that's coming up. So how did you find, um, what type of essential oils yeah, do yeah, you yeah. use to help manage it then? Yeah. And so that's the thing is, is unlike, let's say, 15 years ago where I didn't have a medicine cabinet, I would just sometimes just, just find myself you know, curled up in my bed, just dealing with a panic attack, just mm -hmm. grinning and bearing it, that will never happen again. So mm -hmm. there's a list. Um, well, first of all, this is really important. Again, I'll give you guys a quick list and gals, I'll give okay. you a quick list of things, but I, I want to preface this by saying we need to find what works for us. And, mm -hmm. and I know you'll appreciate this more than some other folks who might not be as intuitive or, or keen into, our, our whole life existence. But what I have found is some people, anxiety and stress can be triggered by aromatherapy. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when someone, and there's a lot of work when it comes to PTSD, emotional recall healing, when it comes to abuse and trauma, which mm -hmm. is why actually I talk about this. I talk about addiction in my book heavily because I, I share more of my story. I explain okay. how to overcome it. I explain some aspects of abuse and trauma because- Fantastic. If, Good. Let me, let me oh, we got to go back a little bit to the olfactory system. But you know, have you ever smelled something that made you remember or have a feeling of a memory long ago? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like what's an example? Like Thanksgiving dinner is common for people or something, you know, right. something like that. Like, do you have anything mm -hmm. that comes to mind? Um, there's a certain cream that my father used um, when he was sick. And so it reminds me of him. He died when I was like 18. For years and years and years, you know, I would carry a, a pillowcase around. I mean, not, you know, not out of the house, but I would smell the pillowcase that he used to use to remind myself of him. And then eventually that smell faded, you know, because 
that's what happens. Right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I still know the cream that he used. So sometimes I will smell that to remember him. And so when you smelt that, what were the emotions and the feelings that that were evoked? A comfort. Like, like he was there with you. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the beauty of aromatherapy. Because what happens is through the olfactory system, when you smell something, there are physical particles in the air. Like there's actually like, that's why it faded away because those physical particles just dissipated over time. Yeah, Those physical particles interact with your nose. And there's something known as an olfactory system that starts through the nasal mucosa of your nose and it triggers an impulse that goes directly to your brain. Unlike every other system in your body, every other, whether it's pain, whether it's sexual desire, whether it's any sort of autonomic function, What happens is when you smell something, there's no thalamic relay, which means you smell direct impact to your brain, Mm -hmm. just without interpretation in your brain. That's a big deal because what happens is you can imprint your brain. Your brain becomes imprinted. Like we think of muscle memory when you're working out at Mm -hmm. the gym, you have brain memory that when you smell something, it triggers a variety of different autonomic function, um, like memory, mood, emotion, mm-hmm. and heart rate, breathing capacity. And that's your limbic system. That's your primal brain. That's really what. That's really our connection to the primates. That yeah. that limbic system, right? Mm-hmm. Through smell. So on the flip side, though, let's say there was a smell like you're, you know, enjoying the reminiscing of your father. But imagine if your father were abusive. Mm -hmm. And imagine if that smell elicited fear. Yeah. That's what happens to people. So when someone, Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, when it comes to abuse and trauma, there would be a smell in the environment, which is very common. Um, And sometimes it could be a strong cologne or a perfume. Sometimes it could be roses. It could be something like you had an abusive husband or boyfriend who bought you roses and you had a, a horrible evening. And that smell of roses could trigger in stress or anxiety just by smelling it. Okay. That is where people need to be very conscious and mm. intuitive of what works for them. So all that to yeah. say is you might not even realize what the trigger is. You just know, ooh, this isn't for me. A friend of mine, Dr. Tony Jimenez, manages um, alternative cancer natural therapy clinics all over the world. And every one of his cancer patients, he walks through, he has a, a clinician walk them through emotional recall healing. Because at the core, Dr. Tony believes that cancer is an emotional disorder. So what he does is he'll have his emotional recall therapist go back in time. Mm -hmm. And they always use aromatherapy to help, to help Mm -hmm. not only calm, but to help be an anchor. Because now let's say you're going through a season where you're being guided through therapy, you're getting counseling. Mm -hmm. This is your season of healing. This is your season of empowerment. And let's say it's bergamot, which is a known anti-anxiety agent. If you're using bergamot in the air and enjoying the wonderful aroma of the citrus of bergamot, that right there can anchor you. So when you have an anxious moment or a season five, 10 years from now, it brings you back to your therapy. It brings you back to your healing. It brings you back to being empowered again. So Mm -hmm. that's why I have used some of the oils that I've used essentially as anchors. And for me, lavender is one. And it's unfortunate to say that it's become more cliche. Lavender is just, everyone loves lavender. And for me, I have a very personal experience with lavender. It's not just because the research says it. It's not just because it's rich in a chemical that's known as linalool, which is known for its calming and sedative anti-convulsant and, you know, anxiolytic anti-anxiety properties. Like lavender is the one that a lot of people use. But for me, Mm -hmm. I have a very I have a very personal experience with lavender because it was the first essential oil I've ever smelled. Mm. And it was one of those where I smelt it in a time when it was right at that time I had my spiritual conversion. And Mm. it was just something that was a subtle because I had my spiritual conversion. I ended up experiencing lavender through hand soap, believe it or not. And I'll never Mm. forget just smelling my hands and just smelling, wow, this is the most beautiful smell I've ever smelled. In that same time though, I was going to this spiritual epiphany. So when I smell lavender, it literally reminds me of 18 years ago. Uh-huh. It's not just because, oh, it's calming or lavender. No, I have like a personal experience with yeah, it. Yeah, you but you're I'm saying, saying you, can, you can condition the body. Yes. The mind, really. Well, the olfactory system, you're, condition, you're conditioning the whole person yes. to, to rest, relax, feel better, feel calmer, 
in relationship to a certain essential oil, a certain smell. Yes. And and there's a list. So again, going back to linalool, um, mm-hmm. you know, top to bottom, like there, there's, there's a variety of concentrations. So these essential oils, they're volatile organic compounds. They are extracted from plants. They're steam distilled or they're cold pressed, like you cold press an olive. That's how you get the citrus. They, they get the rind of the orange or the bergamot mm-hmm. or, and then they cold press it. So these essential oils are, are a cornucopia of up to 300 different plant-based chemicals. Again, they're from the plants. The plants are rich in bioactive chemicals. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to linalool, that is one, again, one of those components and also lineal acetate. These are two components that are known for their anxiety relieving properties across the board. And so there's varying concentrations. Like for example, your average lavender will have anywhere from 25 to 45% of the lavender will be of, will contain linalool. So you have lavender, you have a bunch of different chemicals, 25 to 45% of those chemicals will be linalool. It's, it's rich, but going from top to bottom, 95% 95% of ho wood, H O, ho wood is linalool. So, ho wood is extremely beneficial for people that deal with panic attack and stress. Um, mm. Coriander seed, that's another one. Magnolia, I love ma- being from Georgia. Mm. I, mm-hmm. that was my next love. Lavender was my first, my next love. I've never smelled. Like if there's a smell in heaven, I actually call it my heavenly scent. <laughs> if there is a smell in heaven, I'm convinced it's it's magnolia, magnolia. blossoms. It's it has great. a subtle, sweet, but lemony, floral just essence that just wow. That right there, mm-hmm. bergamot. Bergamot mm-hmm. mint is is a specific variety of mint. Again, going from top to bottom, anywhere from like roughly 25 to 50 percent of bergamot mint is um contains linalool, but you have neroli, which is orange blossoms, lavender. I mentioned elang lang. We can talk mm-hmm. all day long about the anxiolytic properties of elang lang, especially when it comes to sex. It's been clinically shown to reduce the anxiety related to stress. And mm. I'm sorry, sex. And why is there anxiety related to sex? Well, performance, vaginal dryness, a lot of reasons, right? So pettit, pettit grain is another citrus. Bergamot itself is a citrus. Again, going down the line, clary, sage, and geranium. So I just listed mm. what, 12, 15 oils. Yeah, we have a good list. So right? I'm, I'm going to ask you then, how do people use these? Um, to reduce their anxiety? Like what's the practical application of them? So now we've got the list. What do you recommend they do? Well, first is you have to try and you have to see, right? So again, you might not have, you know, bergamot mint on hand. So hopefully you so have they lavender. order some of these like online or yeah. they find a good source. They feel like it's reputable. Well, How do they find a good source? There are several good essential oil companies out there. We have more of a step-by-step process of how to find something that works for you. But ultimately, okay. that's really what we recommend is, is find an essential oil that's pure with okay. no adulterants. And mm-hmm. I guess a key to really expedite the process for people is look for transparency. Look for a company willing to put out the report about what the batch includes. It's called a GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry report. It's essentially the blood panel of the oil. So when you're going lavender oil and you search and you see three or four hits on Google or whatever search engine you use, Mm -hmm. you click on the lavender and you're looking at it, you should see a report readily available. If not, you should get on chat and say, Hey, do you have a batch report of your lavender? And, Uh and if they're not willing to give it to you, or if it's not readily available, that has now become a red flag. It's become a red flag because that report. Yeah. Because why is because this report, not that I expect you to be a chemist, but what this report will tell you is it will literally tell you if there are adulterants in it. It'll say, hey, this is within normal limits. It's within now. There are pesticides, there are adulterants, there's chemicals. It'll just let you know from a third party because these okay. companies pay millions of dollars for a third party to test their product before it goes out the, to, to market. Supposedly, okay. right? If they're not right. paying for that, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with it. So you get the oil mm-hmm. and you try. 
And so what's known as the organoleptic evaluation, you kind of want to feel, you want to experience, and especially for something like anxiety, you want to, you want to get a feel for whether or not this is for you. So I would always start with like the little five milliliter bottles. Like don't go buy the big $5,000 kit. Just, okay. just get a couple oils. And uh -huh. if you have a neighbor or a friend who uses essential oils, why not go to them and say, Hey, can I, can I borrow a couple drops? Like you could seriously go get a cotton swab. And put mm -hmm. a couple drops in that, put it in, um, you know, a plastic baggie and go home and just have, you know, just borrow a couple drops and, and, and start from there. Just start with five or five or six. So what you'll do, I mean, just again, just to put it somewhere. So you're not like oils aren't going to, we're going to hold it. Right. So if you were to put like, for example, a couple drops in a, in like a cotton swab or a uh -huh. cotton ball, um, store it where it's individually packaged, where it's not going to be combined with another cotton ball. If that makes sense. Yeah, so you got yeah, your cotton yeah, ball yeah, yeah. with lavender, your cotton ball right, with orange. We, let's say we've got our three little baggies with our cotton balls in them and you they're all different. It. Essentially, you smell it. Okay. So, <laughs> so I was so getting start, to. Yeah, yeah, I like get I'm it. picturing people sitting on their couch smelling their baggies. Yeah. So, right? so you, you basically <laughs> And their partners going like, "What are you doing over there?" <laughs> well, here's where you start. So you get your cotton swab and you first want to stimulate the olfactory system. Uh -huh. So you just smell. I mean, just okay. literally smell close your eyes so this is why they have like the diffusers is putting the smell into the air yes this is ah, okay. part of it so again you have your cotton swab and what you want to do is you just want to see and if you have zero reaction this is key this is really really key and i hope you guys take this for everything that you take whether it's a drug a supplement an oil a food mm -hmm. okay. you're looking for zero a benign reaction or a positive reaction. You should never, ever, ever have an adverse reaction when you take a supplement, when you use a drug, when you inhale an essential oil. A bad mm -hmm. reaction is your body saying, no, I don't need this. I don't want this. Yeah. So that's kind of why I'm trying to paint the picture here. And I'll go into all the little okay. sprays and inhalers in just a minute. So you want to smell this thing first. And this what starts the organ the what's known in aromatherapy as the organoleptic evaluation. You have to experience this because you have no idea what this is going to trigger in you it's at a subconscious mm -hmm. level. Hopefully, it's something like lavender or ylang lang. Most people smell it and they're like, "Oh, I feel that's nice. That feels good." Mm -hmm. If that's the case, and especially if you're having an anxious, stressful moment, you should find yourself immediately, like literally immediately, no 10 minutes to the work, this stuff within immediate second or two, you should find yourself at slight calm, the mm -hmm. edge slightly okay. taken off. You should be placed into the parasympathetic system immediately by mm -hmm. inhaling this. And what does that look like? Well, it's how you feel. It's how you experience yeah. your heart rate immediately. I mean, I'm talking instant. Your heart rate starts to calm, especially if you if you know what panic is like me, anxiety, your heart rate, respiratory rate, the mind starts racing. When I get to my lavender or my Lang Lang or my bergamot and I smell, it's like immediate relief. That's what we're looking for. And if that's the case, okay, cool. You find your one or two or three that work for you. Now you're in my world. And now it's like, okay, what do you do? Go to Amazon, type up aromatherapy diffuser, pay 15, 20 bucks, get one. They're filled. You know, you get water, you put a couple mm -hmm. drops in your water tank, boom, you're good to go. So what does that mean? Well, if you're having an anxious kind of day and stressful, well, you get your go-to oil, you put three, four, five drops in your water tank diffuser and you let that thing run. Now it mists. And then mm -hmm. you have other little strategies. Like what I have found very helpful is an aromatherapy inhaler. It looks like a lipstick tube. It's, it's like basically a glass tube with mm -hmm. a cotton swab. That's like a, you know, I would ideally recommend organic cotton swab and you mm -hmm. saturate that with essential oils. Again, we have all the recipes in the book, but mm -hmm. now you have this little tube and it's on the go. It's personalized and yeah, it won't you this take is, it with you. Yes. And the key Got is it. it's personalized. Because yeah. more and more schools and offices are prohibiting the use of aromatherapy and other scents because they realize smell, especially the fake ones. And by the mm -hmm. way, a little tangent, an important tangent for everyone that could relate to anxiety or stress. The number one thing everyone has to do, this is like non-negotiable, is if you have fragrances in your home, artificial, through candles, aerosols, or sprays throw them in the trash 
mm-hmm. clinically proven, clinically proven to stimulate the, para- the, the sympathetic nervous system, which puts you in that fight or flight linked. Mm-hmm. These fragrances are linked to Alzheimer's, cancer, dementia, autoimmunity, and of course, anxiety and stress and mm-hmm. panic. They're toxic. The bottom line is they're toxic and the body doesn't know what to do with them because the body's expecting lavender. The body's mm-hmm. expecting like you put your nose into a rose, you get those beautiful right. plant-based chemicals. But these synthetic knockoff versions of these essential oils, the body looks at like it does a virus. It looks at like it does a toxin and it's it creates mm-hmm. inflammation at the neurological and at the cellular level. So the best thing you could do is throw away all that stuff. And now Mm -hmm. we're in business because now we'll show you how to make your own poo-poo spray. I don't care what it is. It's so Uh easy to make (laughs) with essential oils, right? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. We are insane. And I use the word insanely tongue in cheek, but we are insanely obsessed with smell. Yeah. And it's causing our demise. So all we do Mm -hmm. Is that simple shift, even if you so I want to back up though, yes. like no candles, not synthetically fragrant, no way, no not way, not synthetically fragrant. Okay, so are there like yes, essentially fragrant candles? Yeah, that people make. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, before okay. they made this, <laughs> before they made these horrible chemicals, all candles were like you know regular whatever soy based or beeswax based with essential oils like uh, until okay, they got invented it, got it. this right. time so just check yeah. out your candles i have heard that yeah. it's coming back to me yeah. check out your candles just essential yeah. oils go to the natural okay. health food store say hey i only want essential oils in my candles i only want essential yeah. oils in my cleaner i only want essential oils in my body care yeah yeah i i prefer the natural cleaners anyway i mean covid sort of covid sort of put a wrench in things but i remember telling one of my friends cuz my mom community, uh, my kids were growing up was very hippy dippy. I will say that. Right. So it, it was very much about natural and home birth and, you know, breastfeeding too long. I'll say <laughs> personally too long, uh, meaning like years and all kinds of stuff. So I had said to one of my friends, like, I just, I'm going to kill us all with the cleaners. Like, I don't want to die that way. <laughs> you know, like I'm not doing this. Like I yep. got to use my like more natural cleaners and I will clean well and everything, but you know, I don't want that risk. So I hear you. You can absolutely do um, some recipes and you have those in your free book and you're saying you have them in the new book that's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about the new book, the essential oils apothecary is it's essentially part two of, of my first book. My first book is called The Healing Power of Essential Oils, and it gives people the 101 version of, of a, aromatherapy, but it goes into, okay, okay. here are your cleaners, here are your uh-huh. body care, here are your basic stuff, here's a help with energy, help with fungal infections. Like We're talking a basic overview, but what I got was a lot of people like, okay, great, I got the basics, but what do I do for this? And then uh-huh. this, this was a pretty pretty profound task like cancer. Mm -hmm. I have cancer. Can essential oils help me with this experience? Not to ever say that essential oils are the cure because no, but what we're talking about is what can I do now? Maybe radiation burns. How do I, how do oils interact with Alzheimer's? How do essential oils help with libido, erectile dysfunction? And so what I did was I combined all the research that we have out there. And as far as I know, mm-hmm. it's the most like exhaustive literature review on chronic disease and conditions. Ah, Starting okay, so yeah. it goes more in detail yes. into chronic diseases, conditions. Step okay. by step by step. You're not going to find another resource on the list of chronic. And why chronic? Because mm-hmm. if you have one, you're likely to have another. And I get that because mm-hmm. in you too, right? If you have stress yeah. or anxiety, you're much more likely to have depression. If you're de- depressed, yeah. you're much more likely to have addiction. If you're addicted, Yeah, you're much more likely to blah blah blah. So that's where they all come into play. And so that's where the essential oils apothecary is my my solution to help people. Okay, let's go into some advanced strategies and protocols of what really to do for these chronic diseases, and then how to actually enjoy life. And and that's what we're hoping for that people get out of this book is that they get some tools not only to find relief, but hopefully get on the path to resolution. Wonderful. 
Good. Well, thank you so much. We're coming to our end of the time here, and I am very excited about your new book. So can you please tell people how to find you and how to find the book? Yeah. Again, thank you so much. It's been fun. Um, and I hope it's inspired and encouraged people to to know this, that you know, taking my story and your story, we're not a victim of our circumstances. Right. We really do have the power to heal and regenerate the power is in our hands. And I hope that you find that essential oils will help you. And so we have a ton of free resources on naturallivingfamily.com. That's my website. And if you really want to dive deep into this topic with me on, on anxiety and stress, addiction, depression, and all the other chronic conditions that are debilitating our loved ones, I ask you to pick up a copy of my new book, called The Essential Oils Apothecary. It's available everywhere books are sold. And we have a really cool bonus package for people that buy the book. It's just a free gift with videos and fun stuff that actually we show you how to make the recipes at eoapothecary.com. Great. Then that will be in the show notes for people too. And um, again, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for having me. God bless everyone. truly enjoying today's episode. Remember that you can get free hypnosis downloads over at my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. I work all over the world doing hypnosis. So if you're interested in working with me, please schedule a free consultation over at my website and we'll see what your goals are and if I can be of service to you in helping you reach them. Finally, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast or tell a friend. That way, more and more people learn about the power of hypnosis. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Peace.